of history and the history of politics. This is what the Kerber History Forum is all about. And I am absolutely delighted that more than 500 participants have joined us for this unique forum to connect history and politics. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, a warm welcome to all of you. This is the fifth edition of the Kerber History Forum, but it is also the first virtual edition. We will discuss and engage on our digital conference platform, but also we will reach out to a wider audience via our live stream and the social media. Together with our speakers and guests, we will use the applied history approach to put crisis in context. How will the post-COVID-19 world look like? How will future historians look at our time in 50 or 100 years from now? And will they compare our crisis with other major turning points of history, like maybe the world economic crisis in the 1920s? Well, let me give three preliminary answers. First, future historians will discover structural trends that are still elusive to us today. Structural changes in the ways our societies work or structural changes in global politics. Second, future historians will give a face to the millions of people who have died in the course of this pandemic. Today, the number of deaths may sometimes often look like an abstract figure or number, but future historians will unveil the names, they will research the biographies of these victims. Maybe just as historians today do with past crises, conflicts or wars. And this way of remembering individuals rather than numbers also will make our current crisis much more visible and tangible for future generations. Third answer, future historians will work in a historiographic universe which will most probably be completely digital. The sources future historians use, the analytic instruments they will apply, and the products of their research, everything will be based on digital technology. And this is also the reason why Körber Stiftung has started a new program in this year uh, called e-commemoration. E-commemoration is about using the transformative power of the digital world in finding new ways of dealing with history and communicating about history. Or, to put it in a more catchy phrase, e-commemoration is history and memory understood digitally. We will start this program officially tomorrow at this Kerber History Forum. Tonight, we will not apply digital instruments to history, but do exactly the opposite. We will apply history to the digital world by looking at the historical context of big tech, big data, and big brother. And I'm delighted that four fantastic speakers and guests have joined us for this debate. Neil Ferguson, who is one of the leading historians of our time and who has just published a book on the politics of catastrophe. Marietje Scharke, cyber policy expert from Stanford University and former Dutch MEP. Jamie Suskind, London-based barrister and author, writing and speaking about technology, politics and law. And the discussion will be chaired by Catherine Kluver Ashbrook, co-founder and executive director of the Future of Diplomacy project at Harvard's Kennedy School and upcoming new director of the German Council on Foreign Relations here in Berlin. Ladies and gentlemen, connecting history and politics, making sense of the present by consulting the past, this is our mission at the Kerber History Forum. Let us jointly gain new insights and new perspectives in the upcoming one and a half days. At the beginning I said, this fifth edition is the first virtual edition. Well, it will also be the last virtual edition. 
because by next year, by 2022, we will have defined the new normal of the Kerber History Forum. And this means that we will combine the best of two worlds. We will welcome many of you here in Berlin back in this uh, premises, but also we will welcome many of you virtually from all over the world. The future is hybrid. With this, over to Catherine Kluver and her guests. Well, thank you, Dr. Paulsen. Thank you for that warm introduction. Uh, and I think it speaks of the timeliness of the way that you have framed this conversation to start with uh, a deep dive into how technology has changed and shaped our new normal, not just uh, in these COVID times, but in the way that we really think about the critical questions that drive our world, how we think about power, how we think about the relationship between our systems, uh, our democracies, and frankly, the relationship that we have to one another. So I am exceptionally pleased to be here with this, ex this, this panel this evening, your time, uh, and uh, the middle of the day on the East Coast, not so much for our colleagues who are on the West Coast for whom this is still very much the morning. These last six weeks, these last eight weeks, I think have made clear if they weren't already crystallized through the new realities of the pandemic, how dependent we are on technologies, how the way that now we think about warfare and interference uh, in systems can influence the way that we conduct our daily lives. If I think just about the reality that Americans uh, have faced over the last eight weeks, First, the insecurity over the solar winds hack and how much data uh, from the US government had now made it over into uh, Russia, a NATO nation state actor. Again, only detected in part by an interplay of government and technology, but then also an insecurity of the gas pumps for many Americans over this past week uh, after the colonial ransomware attack. And then of course, a resident of Mar-a-Lago who is now wondering where his own personal freedoms went in terms of his expression on the internet. And I'm speaking, of course, of the former US President Donald Trump, uh, where Facebook, we saw, decided just a few weeks ago, or just a few days ago now, that uh, he best be kept off of the social media platform uh, that, frankly, dominates the world. So I think this is a very timely discussion to discuss how data uh, and now, well, first the digital revolution, now the data revolution, but the interworkings of platforms in general uh, are influencing the way that we think about our future, but conversely, what we might learn from how networks uh, have driven historical progress. And so it's really my pleasure to welcome Neil Ferguson, who all of you will know as the Milbank Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. He is a colleague of mine at the Belfer Center, long-term colleague and collaborator. Um, in addition to his many academic accolades, we've just heard about his new book came out May 4th, uh, Doom, the Politics of Catastrophe. He's written also a book, a bestseller, very relevant to our discussion today, this morning, The Square and the Tower, uh, a page turner, truly in my uh, consideration. But he also has um, the smarts, had the smarts to steal my very favorite uh, research assistant out from under me. So again, that speaks for his capacities of negotiation and persuasion. So welcome, Neil, uh, who joins us from California. <clears throat> uh, our second Thank you, guest. Catherine. Pleasure to see you. Um, and uh, if I arrived rather in, in the last minute, that was because I was uh, talking to our mutual friend Fareed Zakaria. Uh, just uh, just moments uh, before we got started. So apologies to you and the other panelists that I wasn't there for the uh, the green room. Well, we will certainly make you make you uh, pay your penance because uh, we're going to lean straight into uh, your analysis, both in this last book and the book before as we open our discussion. I want to welcome also Jamie Suskind, uh, who many of you will know is a barrister and author, has written a, a very smart book, I think, about the change of public administration, something that we worry about here at the Future of Diplomacy Project respect, with respect to uh, AI and the diplomatic practice, uh, Living Together in a World Transformed by Tech, is the 2018 title of Jamie's book. 
He too is a, a not too distant colleague of mine in the past at Harvard where he was a Berkman Klein fellow and has been uh, a fellow in, in many other prestigious institutions, including the Becklin Institute um, and at Cambridge University. And last but certainly not least, my good friend and colleague, Marie Tioshaka, who we've heard spent many years uh, thinking critically about the changes in the public domain uh, as a member of the European Parliament. Uh, has now made a shift into the world of academia and uh, critical advancement of these issues uh, at the Cyber Policy Center and is a fellow at Stanford's Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence and also the president of the Cyber Peace Institute in Geneva. So welcome to all three of you. Neil, I want to start with you as the historian because this is an applied history conference and of course the ability to manipulate data, to retell narrative, to uh, use network structured and to understand hierarchies in networks, which is the primary focus uh, of the square and the tower where you so eloquently show that not only is it about creating proximity in networks through history, but that the hierarchies that these networks create say something about how power is pushed within societies and mitigated. And we're now at this odd phase that you and another um, article describe as you know, a moment of time where technology companies, but also nation states, if you think specifically of China's closed uh, technology environment in which it has uh, you know, allowed itself or been able to execute power over other parts of the world. How should we think about the usefulness of the analogy of analogies from history network structures, hierarchies within, as we try to wrap our head around how we think about power mitigation in this technologically catalyzed world? Well, Catherine, I think part of the challenge is that we often uh, assume that the world has been so transformed by technology that history really doesn't have much to offer. When I first moved to Stanford uh, after 12 happy years at Harvard, I was slightly shocked to encounter the Silicon Valley mentality, which essentially was that history had begun roughly with the Google IPO and everything before that was the Stone Age and of no interest. Now, I think this was hubris, a little bit like the hubris that I'd encountered on Wall Street pre-crisis, before the 2008 financial crisis, when the masters of the universe assumed that uh, all the problems of uh, economic policy management had been solved, and there would never be another recession. And so I went about my business as an historian writing The Square and the Tower to try to argue that there is, in fact, a lot that we can understand by studying history about our current predicament. Uh, because although the, the internet is, is new, and although the big tech platforms are new, uh, this is not the first uh, revolution in communications. This is not the first transformation of the public sphere that we've seen. And what we need to do, I think, is to be creative about the historical analogies that we draw on. There's been, a, I think, an unfortunate tendency in recent decades, always to be looking for analogies with uh, in the 20th century. Somehow it's always the 1930s, whatever happens. Uh, whoever comes along that we don't like is, is Mussolini or, or Hitler. But my view is that we can actually learn relatively little from the mid 20th century because the structure of communications networks then was so different. Uh, in particular, it was relatively easy to centralize control of communications in the mid 20th century. That was one reason that totalitarian regimes were able to function. And if you don't believe me, read Stephen Kotkin's Stalin biography when Stalin could basically tap the telephone network of the Soviet Union personally uh, and listen in on whichever conversation he liked. We, we're not in that world anymore. We're not in a world in which it was straightforward, in fact, for a dictatorship to control all of the media and ensure that the message was entirely unmixed. Uh, so I think we need to look further back, actually. And in The Square and the Tower, I argue that our, our own time more closely resembles the period after the printing press uh, was widely spread throughout Europe. We're kind of rerunning a version of the 16th and 17th century, but at about 10 times the speed of the original uh, Reformation. And what's happening is that the, the relatively decentralized communications tools of the internet 
in some measure resemble the, the communication tools of, of the printing press. And when that shift, when that analogy uh, struck me, I, I realized immediately that we would expect a time of, of polarization, uh, just as happened uh, after the printing press was introduced. And we would e expect uh, mad ideas as well as good ideas to circulate very rapidly, because that's what happened in the 16th and 17th centuries. Nobody initially expected the printing press to be anything but a force for good. But of course, it turned out that you could not only circulate translations of the Bible into the vernacular, you could also circulate uh, books about witchcraft, uh, allowing people to identify witches in their local communities. And uh, you, you didn't just have one set of ideas about how to fix the Roman Catholic Church. You had dozens, and each one more radical than the one before. So my rough suggestion to people who want to think historically about our own time is don't look at the 20th century for inspiration. Rather, you should look further back in time and think of the communications transformation brought about by the internet as somewhat similar to the communications transformation brought about by the printing press. And I'll add one last point uh, at the risk of going on too long. That, that might also be helpful in thinking about the other forms of contagion that we have to grapple with. Uh, my sense of uh, our current predicament is that we really, really want COVID to go away because we're bored of it. Uh, but it's not necessarily going to do that. So just as the plague didn't go away in early modern Europe, it, it kept coming back uh, for more. So maybe we need to acclimatize ourselves not only to a world in which our, our secular debates unconsciously resemble the religious debates of the 16th and 17th century, but it's also a time in which plague will be much more a part of our lives, a recurrent feature of our lives than, than we've been accustomed to. So in the new book, Doom, I kind of move from the contagions of the mind, contagions of the internet, to, to the contagions of the biological world. And, and once again, I find myself thinking how much more like the early modern world our world is. Um, but that's a, an unfamiliar world to many of us, because of course, not that many people study it, uh, particularly in the United States. Well, this is a nice segue to, to how Jamie has thought about these issues in his book. I mean, he notes, of course, uh, Jamie, uh, that uh, these sort of historical revolutions, yes, also lead to a way in which we think about systems to steer and to manipulate and to, um, well, manage, frankly, these sort of challenges. Uh, the way that we've built administrative systems that are surely now designed to, first of all, slow things down, create more deliberative processes, all the things that now in with this catalytic step up, um, and I do think that's probably the most critical difference, the printing press still needed to spread its way physically across Europe and then across the rest of the world. Um, now everything happens at lightning speed. And so the challenge uh, of what that does to institutions of power that are designed to mitigate processes in different ways, um, and then how we deliberate that power, how useful to you do you feel are the historical analogies as you think about then the, the institutions and systems as we have them now? We'll talk later about how our institutions our regulations, our systems need to adapt. But as this technology met uh, the corpus of public administration, um, what, were, what were your reference points? Were there historical reference points that you found helpful or did we need a whole other categorization to think about the phenomena that we were witnessing? Well, thank you so much, Catherine, and thank you to the forum for having me to speak today. It's such an honor to be appearing particularly alongside such uh, illustrious scholars as Maricha and Neil. Um, to answer your question directly, when I started writing Future Politics, I did so out of a suspicion that the, the world we were moving into was one for which we were not prepared intellectually, conceptually, institutionally, legally. And I expected that a lot of the changes that were going to take place in society would be changes uh, for which we didn't yet have an answer. In truth, I came to a slightly different conclusion. There are things that we can learn from the past and there are things that we can't learn from the past. I take issue slightly with some of the, the issues, the points that Neil makes. And, and in particular, I would say that I think digital technology is different in two important ways. The first is that digital technology 
creates a kind of infrastructure uh, which contains rules which the rest of us have to follow. So if you imagine, for instance, driving along in a self-driving car and you want it to go over the speed limit, but it refuses, or you want to park in a, a bay which is reserved for other people and the car doesn't let you, the difference between that world and the world we currently live in is that in that world, you are subject to rules that have been written by other people. And as we are increasingly surrounded by digital technology, those rules are written by the people who write code. So whenever we do interactions or transactions or actions which involve interacting with digital technology, we are subject to the rules inside those technologies. And that's a new and strange form of power. It, it's been likened by scholars like Larry Lessig to, to the power of architecture in the past. But of course, the architecture of digital technology is much more dynamic and much more pervasive. So that's one possible difference. Another possible difference is that the information technologies that we use to gather information and spread it and which filter our perception of the world are substantially, I think, different from the ones of the past. Um, to take just a few examples, for instance, firstly, the, the newspaper or the book never watched you back, right? Whereas digital technologies gather enormous amounts of data about us. Secondly, when we read a newspaper or a book, we know that we're reading the same thing as everyone else who reads that newspaper or a book. But that's, of course, not the case when I log on to Twitter and when you log on to Twitter or when I log on to Facebook and when you log on to Facebook. Thirdly, when you read The Guardian or The Wall Street Journal, these are publications which wear their allegiances openly. By and large, you know what you're getting, whereas uh, social media platforms, for instance, do not do so. In fact, they would probably claim not to have such allegiances, whether that's right or not. Uh, it is a different matter. But in any event, it's very hard for an outside observer to know the critical lens, the critical filter through which they should be reading the material they see online. Fourthly, I would say that a newspaper or a book is a relatively controlled medium with a relatively stable flow of information from one body to another, whereas the domain of online platforms is fissile and vast. Facebook has more people on it than Christianity. 94% of Americans between the ages of 18 and 24 use Facebook, These uh, use uh, YouTube, forgive me. These are numbers which would stagger and overwhelm anyone in the conventional publishing media. And as a result, the media environment is significantly more volatile. The fifth thing I'd say is that the newspaper industry and indeed the publishing industry to a certain extent is governed by norms which are old and venerated and known. So we know what a good journalist looks like. We know what a what having integrity as a journalist looks like, not revealing your sources, not making up quotes and the like. Those kinds of norms don't yet exist in the digital realm. This isn't a, 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 a problem that needs to persist forever. In fact, I'd like such norms to develop. But the truth is that you don't have the same culture uh, at Facebook as you would at the Wall Street Journal. And that means that when they ask to self-regulate, uh, you're entitled to be a little bit more skeptical about it. And finally, what I think the difference between our age and the past is that social media platforms don't just edit their own content and produce their own content. They edit and sort and rank and file the rest of us. They determine what you see of what I say and, what, uh, and they are able therefore to insert themselves between the people in, of a democracy in a way that um, previous publishing means couldn't. So for all of those reasons, I think you might say that actually the world we're moving into is quite different. I would just, I would ask one further question though, which I wish I'd asked more as, a, as, a, as an undergraduate when I studied history, which was, why do we try to draw historical analogies in the first place? And is the relevant question, is this like the past? And in what respects is this like the past? Jack Bulkin, the, the scholar says that the better question is, what do new technologies make salient about society? What patterns and power structures do they expose and make more prominent? So instead of focusing on the technologies themselves, focus on the consequences they have for society and ask how they change us in that respect. And the whole thesis of my work is that technologies, unfortunately, are leading to a concentration of power and an unaccountable power in the hands of those who own and control them. But I'm sure that's something we'll come on to. <clears throat> so Jamie, you've eloquently mapped all the negative uh, consequences and questions uh, that we ask ourselves now. But of course, when the digital revolution, um, which foreshadowed the data, revolution and changes in which we find ourselves now began. It was about creating a more amplified, more equal uh, public square, this idea uh, 
that you know publics would begin to speak to their government with 21st century technologies, as Madeleine Albright has pointed out, and then government systems, on the other hand, would only be able to answer with 19th century um, ideas or uh, uh, well or devices, frankly. Marita, you were in the thick of that, I think, when you were still, of course, an elected uh, government official. So, I mean, originally we thought, well, look, um, you know, using the analogy of history in terms of bringing people together, um, you know, on the streets, that ultimately tanked things like the Transatlantic Investment Partnership, the fact that you suddenly had um, organizations that could network online and create advocacy online. On the flip side, you know, we, I think the U.S. State Department looked very fondly at the capacities of Twitter, which they thought they sh should still and could be able to steer in 2009 when uh, we were looking um, at the Iranian revolution, because the idea, this gets back to the institutional piece that I want to push Jamie on a little later, was back then that American government could still steer the capacities of American technology. Uh, and here we are in a much different age. The big questions are, do nation states still have monopoly power on questions like violence, uh, on security, on financial transactions, all the things that for a long time were the remit of nation states, but that themselves also emerged from networks. Think of the powerful city networks that Neil describes at the beginning of Square and Tower. So Marita, I mean, now you're looking at this from the outside. But there's clearly been an arc of development here, even in your time in active policymaking. So, you know, even from that perspective, um, how do we think about how power has shifted just over this past decade alone? Thank you for the question. Thank you for the invitation. It's a, a pleasure and honor to uh, speak on this panel with uh, such esteemed uh, guests. Um, a couple of forces were very um, present when I was serving in the European Parliament between 2009 and 2019. And uh, one particular belief, uh, almost religious conviction, was that the democratizing power of new technologies would be inevitable. That as long as people had access to these tools, that there would be progress uh, in return. Uh, I think about the uh, Arab uprisings and the high hopes that people, particularly in the West, put in these so-called Facebook and Twitter revolutions. Uh, but there was much less uh, assessment of, for example, how authoritarian states were also getting smarter, using new technologies to survey, to repress, to hack, to trace these students, these uh, protesters, dissidents, journalists, and bloggers, to find them in their homes, to um, prevent them from having any freedom after speech. I mean, it was it was an open invitation when a company like Facebook was uh, allowed for use in a country like Syria. But of course, the authorities were happy to scan every single message that was posted and to trace it back to individuals that had, had said anything critical about the authorities. And so the sort of pink glasses, this rosy, lens through which people, particularly in Silicon Valley, but by proxy also in Washington, were looking at the uh, liberalizing effects that new technologies would bring were, I think, uh, uh, naive and, and dogmatic. And they overshadowed important lessons that we could have also paid more attention to historically, not even that long ago in history, but for example, 9-11 which in Europe at the time that I was serving in the European Parliament still cast quite a shadow because it had, uh, you know, stretched uh, state powers in, in the name of, of countering terrorism and national security at the expense of civil liberties, also through the use of new technologies. And I think maybe these two stories increasingly came into confrontation with each other. You know, this, this idea of dem democratization with the help of technology globally, wh while there was obvious repression and abuse of state power with the help of technology going on, for example, in the United States. And so I guess the, the overall lesson that I think has become increasingly clear and, and has also come back as a boomerang to the United States is that if you do not ensure that democratic principles, rule of law principles, universal human rights are actually governed and regulated for, they may too get disrupted along with the taxi market, the media, you know, um, all kinds of industries that people were so excited about disrupting. But now the disruption has, has come back to, to eat away at the core 
of open societies and liberal democracies and uh, has exposed how fragile they have become without safeguarding of key principles of checks and balances, of independent oversight and so on and so forth. So I'm gonna circle back to Jamie, then come back to Neil on this very question because Jamie, you know, I, I wanna get more granular here and ask you because you think about public administration Marita just leaned into this and to say, look, you know, this is really has challenged our institutions, I mean, beyond power, but then also structure. Again, you know, our bureaucratic systems were designed to slow things down, make things more equitable, um, you know, maintain a, a hierarchy within an institution of power. No institution uh, in itself is without a need for structure and power. Um, you know, and then around it, it affects the way that we conduct a deliberative democracy. So as you forecast now, stepping away from the historical analogy, but as you forecast now, let's say, well, in an unpredictable time, the next five years, what will this do to our institutions of administration, of public administration specifically? And then I'll kick it wider to, to Neil to think about with us uh, what this does to our wider institutions and, and great power competition. So, Jamie, what does this do to the way that we work in systems in democracies? Well, there has long been a sense, and I, I'm not sure it's necessarily an accurate one, that it's basically impossible to govern digital technologies, that they're somehow different from other industries. And there are, another, there are a number of familiar factors which go into that. One is the globalized nature of digital technologies in the sense that the literal hardware, as well as the bits, are not always easy to pin down in a particular jurisdiction. There is the Delaware effect, where if one area regulates, companies threaten to move to another. There is the resourcing problem by which the best and the brightest are said to be in the private sector rather than in public administration, and the latter are always playing catch up. And then there is the speed of technological change, which happens faster than the legislative or regulatory process. These are all real challenges. But as to wh you know, whether public administrations can come up with an adequate response, we have playing out in front of us in real time, uh, one of the most interesting political experiments uh, in modern history, and it's this. In the United States, there is not a, at least there hasn't been so far, I should say, a great effort to to regulate digital technology, to govern it, other than uh, to reinforce market forces. So to uh, let companies set their own protocols and govern their own conduct uh, and hope that market competition will allow better, um, better outcomes. And that's why, you know, the United States is pretty much the only advanced democracy in the world which doesn't have omnibus data protection laws. What you have playing out in Europe is quite different. Since 2016, you've had the General Data Protection Regulation, which pr provides a comprehensive uh, set of rules about how personal data and data generally might be used. You have on the horizon European Union level acts seeking to govern artificial intelligence, seeking to govern digital markets, seeking to govern uh, digital platforms, and, and those will be law in a year or two. My suspicion is that the European model will... Um, come to vindicate itself. There is no perfect way of governing technology. There's no doubt about it. All of the challenges I outlined at the beginning of this answer are real. But just like there's no perfect way to tax a multinational company, it doesn't mean we don't try to tax them. We, we do our best and we muddle through and we hope that there'll be better ways to cooperate in the future. What I reject is the idea, though, that we have to wait for, or even, indeed that it would even necessarily be desirable to have global governance before we can bring the power of digital technology to heal. I say that in principle because it's not clear to me why, for instance, American First Amendment principles should govern social media platforms in France or Germany, where we just have different approaches to free speech. But also because if we wait for global governance, we'll be waiting forever, which is possibly why uh, many of those in the tech industry are so keen on the idea. So my view is, uh, in some ways, the challenge posed by digital technology to traditional ways of conducting public administration are very severe. They need to be treated as the political challenges that they are. But in some ways, they're just new forms of an old problem. Uh, and Europe, I think, shows that if you, if you want to, you can at least try to govern them in a conventional fashion. Neil, I wonder if you agree with that assessment. I mean, I think so much of what has been put on the table between the Europeans and the Americans over this past year 
well, roughly six years shows that there are some critical value differences and appreciation differences of how uh, both sides view technology. You write in, in Doom that we don't have a very risk-centered approach, and, and Jamie alludes to the fact that the Europeans have just put out a risk-centered AI strategy, uh, which might you know, work to regulate certain amounts of overreach but then might curtail the technological capacities that Europe might need to then work hand in glove to combat or at least think about the technological challenges that are emerging from a closed system that is China. The Chinese have not wasted time uh, in terms of you know, norm and standard setting on the international level. They've put themselves at the head of critical telecommunications uh, and standards bodies that others might ignore. So as you look toward the wider environment um, and the differences, and Marita will come into this as well, between the Europeans and the Americans on the values front, if institutions and a regulatory form are the answer, how is the West going to get this together? How will they address these differences? If indeed there's such a thing as, as the West anymore, uh, I, I think it's um, appropriate in, in a discussion like this to, to take issue with uh, the other panelists when appropriate. So before I answer your, your question, which I'll get to, I just want to respond to something that, that Jamie said. I mean, lawyers are applied historians, especially in, in England, and so they can't really say what use is history. Uh, but when you're addressing a question like, what do we do about the internet? Uh, I'm not sure that we can afford to disregard it, even if we acknowledge the profound differences that that you you pointed out, Jamie, with which I don't disagree. In fact, the Square in the Tower says the internet started out being a bit like the printing press, but then it ended up evolving very rapidly because of the changing structure created by the network platforms into something centralized and a kind of privatized uh, surveillance state uh, emerged. I, I've urged my historian... Uh, protégés uh, in recent years to read science fiction as well as history in order to try to create uh, alternate historical analogies in the realm of, <clears throat> of the future because when we're trying to think about the impact of technological change you're quite right Jamie history doesn't give us enough to go on and I've found that my thinking on these issues has improved since I went back to reading uh, science fiction think think of Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash as a kind of brilliant and prophetic vision of a world in which we'd spend half our time online and our avatars would be having more fun than us. I mean, I'd, I'd say what's great about applying history to these problems is precisely that you spot what Collingwood called the tiger in the grass. When people run around online uh, cancelling hate speech, you just need a, a few brief steps to realize that what they're really trying to do is burn heretics metaphorically. And the language of, of wokeism, which Matthew Iglesias captured brilliantly with the phrase, the great awakening, is actually manifestly coded religion. So I think, I think history enables you to spot, to do some pattern recognition that you might otherwise not be able to do. I, I do think the way in which secular politics is now essentially religion on both the left and the right is a, a good example of that. Uh, from workism to the QAnon cult. Um, but let, let me now come to this question of what we do about, uh, about regulation and how we also think about artificial intelligence. Inevitably, and I agree with Jamie about this, there will not be a global regime that addresses the problems that we are worried about. There, there may well be a global regime that sort of ducks those problems, but Ultimately, the major geographies, the major policies will have to do this their own way. <clears throat> and I think the interesting thing about the United States is that there's plenty of historical uh, analogies to build on. If the question is, how do you regulate a large network with all kinds of public uh, goods and, uh, and potential negative externalities? We just decide, we've just decided to ignore them. And I think the failure to, to think uh, about the the analogies with railroads, think about the analogies with earlier electronic media, has given rise to the ultimate cul-de-sac, which is to go down the antitrust route. Now, the antitrust actions will not really address the central problems of internet non-regulation in the US. For me, the central problems are, number one, 
uh, Section 230, which is overly broad and allows a kind of catch-22 situation where the big tech companies <coughs> can say when any uh, harmful content appears, oh, well, it's not our problem. We're just tech platforms. We're not publishers. But when they engage in systematic political censorship, uh, including even that of the President of the United States, then that's okay because the First Amendment doesn't apply to them because they're private companies. But that's the catch-22 argument. It, it basically means that they are publishers when it suits them and they're tech platforms when it suits them, and you can't sue them. And that's one reason they make so much money. They have barely any liabilities. Uh, and, and I think that has to change. And my recommendation after the square in the tower was you have to kind of at least change Section 230 and create some quasi-First Amendment right in cyberspace, not try to fix this through regulation, let it be fixed in the courts. And I think the Supreme Court already took some key steps in the right direction by saying the internet is the public sphere. It isn't just a domain where private companies could do whatever they like uh, on the basis of their own terms and conditions. So I think the US has got a long way to go before we, we grapple with the problems that were obvious at least in 20, as early as 2016 because we've decided to go down the blind alley of, of antitrust actions. <clears throat> There's a broader issue here when, when you come to Europe, and now I'm, I'm, I'm approaching answering the question, uh, but I mean, we're having a discussion here, not just, not just connected interviews. <clears throat> I think there's a problem which Europeans have to confront, is that, which is that they failed to be part of the great internet revolution, and there are no big European tech companies, really. <clears throat> and, and ultimately, therefore, Europe just becomes this market which the US and Chinese tech companies fight over. And Europeans have to be careful not to continue to impair their capacity for innovation by uh, regulations that are ultimately uh, ultimately counterproductive. The AI revolution is happening in the US and, and, the, uh, and in China much more than it's happening uh, in 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 Europe, for I think partly for these, though not wholly for these reasons. If I try to take a step back and again think like a historian, what I see are the early phases of Cold War II, and in this Cold War, uh, the real arms race is not in the nuclear domain; it's in uh, cyber uh, uh, in the cyber domain. And artificial intelligence and quantum computing and much else are the kind of key races that are being run. And my view at, the po at this point is that now that the United States is beginning to realize it's in a Cold War, it has a decent chance of winning. Uh, if you look at the Marco Polo report from last year, a lot of the AI talent ends up in the US from the rest of the world, including China. Um, I mean, there's, there's in that sense a great importation of talent to the US that's unrivaled anywhere else. And that's why I think the US will win most of these races, just as it's basically won the vaccine race with, with China. So my analogy for thinking about the geopolitics of tech is actually a much more 20th century one. Here I'm now going to kind of contradict myself, because it feels like Cold War II. The only way it might not be is if it's actually 30 years War II. And the, the analogy with the Thirty Years' War is interesting because in the Thirty Years' War, um, Europe's not just a, a battlefield, it's a complete killing field. And I think one of the great questions of our time is, does the US-China competition turn the Europe into a battlefield, or is it just a contested market, or is it a backwater because the real battlefield is going to actually be Taiwan, uh, and, and the uh, and East Asia more more broadly, geopolitically, Cold War II feels like the center of of of, uh, of competition is not actually Europe anymore, and Europe may actually not matter that much in in the Second Cold War. Well, we've got the perfect person to answer some of these questions in um, Maritia Schacke. Um, so, Maritia, um, to uh, be a little more brash than Neil. Uh, did Europe just miss the boat technologically and is now trying to claw back whatever remaining power it still has by putting forth a whole package of regulations in the privacy domain, in the taxation domain, in the AI domain? Or is there actually more here? Are they just, is Europe just destined to, in this Cold War II that Neil has just mapped out, to get crushed in the middle or, or you know, shown to, quote unquote, just be a market or what other you know, in German, we would say gestalt, what other sort of frame can, can, uh, can the Europeans muster here? Or is that a done and answered question already? 
Well, it's a big question, but let me begin by picking apart some of the concepts that are in the question and also in, in the, the words that were just shared by uh, Neil. Because first of all, we need to understand what we think success looks like. And if we conclude that Europe has missed the boat, then uh, I guess that is the boat of building huge tech companies. And I think one of the uh, recent lessons, or at least growing awarenesses, is that actually the success of big tech companies does not equal the success of democracy or the success of rights protection or the preservation of the public interest, just to name a couple, or it doesn't actually serve security, just to, to bring in another point that we haven't touched upon as much. Because there is a temptation to really look at you know, the relation between social media companies and democracy, and I think that is important. But I would also like to look deeper than that, which is to say, who governs every digital aspect of people's lives? And so recent uh, events, you mentioned it in your introduction, the, um, uh, the hacking or the, the ransomware attack on uh, colonial pipelines that was you know, meant to steal money but actually crippled critical infrastructure in the United States has revealed how dependent so many functions, so many aspects of our lives, whether it's the personal or the economic or uh, the, the infrastructural, how many processes completely depend on tech but particularly tech companies and how their standards have become the standards to be able to protect the national interest or safeguard democracy. And so if we define Europe's lack of success as a lack of having produced big tech, I'm, I'm not 100% that it is agreeing that it's so bad for Europe. Now, obviously, if you want, and this is the point that, that Jamie made earlier, if you want to roll out higher standards, not only through regulation, but also through technologies that are built on the basis of those values that you cherish, <clears throat> you need growth. Uh, and obviously Europe, and I think European politicians are very concerned with the notion that there is not as much you know, patents being claimed or PhDs graduating in the spaces of AI and other new technologies. So that is definitely uh, an issue to look at. Second point I wanted to touch upon is, is the whole framing of the question of regulation. In the context of this debate about technology, there's a tendency to think about regulation as an outcome as such. You know, we hear Mark Zuckerberg saying, we now want regulation. <laughs> you know, we hear people asking, are you in favor or against regulation? But, you know, for any one of us, and, and uh, I know it's not always uh, the most popular thing to do, but having spent 10 years regulating, we all know it's actually a process that can end up in a gazillion different directions. And so if you look at the relationship between regulations and the growth of tech companies, there are both regulations we can identify that have immensely fostered the growth of commercial tech companies like Section 230 that Niall mentioned, but also uh, trade, trade secret protections to mention another category that has allowed a lot of companies to build their businesses in very opaque ways and to shield their secret sources of algorithmic settings from public scrutiny and accountability. So let's look a bit more deeply at what we hope regulation will achieve. And in that sense, I am hopeful about the European sense of direction because it, it seeks to achieve a preservation of democracy directly, not only as a hoped side effect of market interventions, which is indeed the way in which antitrust is now used. So many people look to antitrust, I think one, because it's a powerful set of tools, you know, it allows for deep inquiries into companies, high fines, you know, decisive action. And I think that's what people want to see in terms of regulation. Uh, but it's actually kind of a, um, I think a, a sad conclusion if we only look to market regulations to preserve democracy. I think democracy and the public interest and human rights deserve to be protected directly and forcefully as such, and not as a, as a hopeful side effect or anticipated side effect of antitrust. Then lastly, on this idea of a Cold War, um, I'll leave it to historians to reflect more uh, on, on where analogies are useful. But in some ways, I'm afraid we're already in a situation of quite hot war. Uh, it is just an invisible confrontation that plays out uh, over the infrastructure that's in the hands of private companies that is really hard on the one hand for the public, you know, let's say my parents to understand what's going on, 
But what's also very peculiar here, and this is where technology truly has created different conditions, it is hard for the state to know at which risk it is. <clears throat> so we saw in the case of the solar winds attack um, <clears throat> that actually another technology company called FireEye revealed what, what had happened. Not intelligence services, not the White House, you know, not CISA or another kind of uh, US government body, but another tech company. And if you ask and look at, you know, the national security uh, intersection with cybersecurity, you will find that a lot of democratic countries rely almost entirely on software companies to build important infrastructure, databases, and so on and so forth, but also to do real-time risk assessments and protection. And so zooming out a little bit now, and then I'll conclude, but between uh, US, Europe, and China, and this whole idea that the US and China are quote unquote more successful, I'm afraid that the democracies of this world have really let too much governance power in the hands of private companies. And that that is a weakness, a vulnerability, not a strength, as it was promised from Silicon Valley, that all democracies now have to reckon with because they have had such a laissez-faire, hands-off, libertarian approach to governance. The US first and foremost, but in many ways the EU too. And even if the EU is playing catch up, uh, it is still very much on its, its back foot vis-a-vis -vis the power of big corporations. Uh, maybe we'll get to China later, but I'll leave it here for now. Yeah, Jamie, I think that's a good place for you to, to, to come in and, and to weigh in on the points that both uh, Neil and Maricha have, have raised here. I mean, what is it systemically, do you feel, uh, th that can frankly be done from, and I'll, I'll lead with the question that's come up in, in the audience, which is uh, an extrapolation of what Maritia has leaned into, which is, you know, are there no ways of setting standards if in order to combat a problem, you need the technology on the other side? So what is true, what Maritia said of solar winds was also true of Colonial, uh, because you had 13 companies pick up on the activities that were happening there. And ultimately, you know, part of the way that um, this collective was squeezed is because of other technology power, uh, other technology companies leading in there. So if fundamentally regulation is only a, a notch and if you need technology to regulate and control other technology, how do you balance and, and, and mitigate that? Well, I, I've given myself a migraine from nodding so aggressively through the answers of both uh, Maricha and Neil, so I don't really want to dissent from a lot of what was said. Um, I'll pick up on a couple of threads, if I may. Neil's point about lawyers being applied historians is well taken, and um, I, I think we're actually in aggressive agreement here. I think lawyers, like historians, like to take modern phenomena and fit them into holes that have arisen from the past. That is literally what lawyers do for a living. They try to find analogies from the past. And if you look at the case law in the Supreme Court, for instance, on what Facebook is, you'll see sometimes it's described as a publisher. Sometimes it's described as a public square. Sometimes it's described as a state with Mark Zuckerberg as the president. Other times it's described as a private debating club. And of course, these are all literally in analogies. None of them is trying to say that it, it, it is precisely those things. It's just trying to say that it is like those things. And frankly, that you know, the language we inherit from the past and the concepts and categories we inherit from the past are all we have. Uh, but sometimes we need to try at least to push beyond it, because I don't think Facebook is any one of those things. I think it's something quite different and quite new for our time that you can draw analogies with it with various other things, but ultimately it's not really like any of them, and it eventually stops being helpful trying to compare them. Henry Ford used to say that when he asked people what they wanted, they would say faster horses, and we've got to make sure that we don't, we don't do too much faster horses thinking, and we're prepared to recognise that when a car comes along, it's actually something fundamentally different. Um, Marija made a point which is incredibly close to my heart, which is about the difference the linguistic difference between regulation and non-regulation. One of the great myths is that the American tech market is unregulated, but of course it's not unregulated. It's subject to a very carefully assembled and intricate set of laws which prioritize a particular set of values. So for instance, very strong intellectual property laws that allow companies to conceal 
uh, their algorithms behind cloaks of secrecy. Section 230, uh, which Neil described earlier, which literally gives technology companies protection from the general law that other companies do not and would not have. Um, contract laws, which allow large corporations to do business with each other. Um, corp the law of um, companies itself, companies are, are, are a legal fiction, they don't exist in nature, but we create them and we give them the rights, and in America they give them lots and lots of rights, uh, because it's considered to be, uh, germane, to be a, to, germane towards a particular form of social ordering. So to set back, the question is not between law and no law, or regulation and deregulation, it's about what your regulation embodies. Does it embody a highly marketized, highly individualized, highly property-based vision of our technological future, the American model? Or does it try to govern technology in a way which emphasizes a more deliberative model, a more collectivist model, a, more, a model based around the public interest rather than the pursuit of private profit alone, the, the European approach? So it's not about deregulation or regulation. Uh, we're all regulated. It's about how we it's about how we choose to do it. And the final thing I'd add on top of that is this. It, I couldn't agree more with what Maricha says about you know what does actually being a winner look like in this context. But I also reject the premise that regulating industries is somehow inimical to economic growth. Uh, I mean, economists have been making this point for centuries. Of course, some kinds of stifling regulation can damage innovation. Too much tax can disincentivize innovation. But actually creating standards which allow consumers to trust new products, systems of certification, systems of um, oversight and accountability, they can actually encourage competition. And what's more, if you create a marketplace through sensible regulation and legal oversight, in which companies are incentivized to innovate, but to innovate towards different goals, whether it's, for instance, innovating towards creating the safest platform for uh, democratic deliberation, rather than just the one uh, which gets the most clicks. If you govern in a way that incentivizes companies differently, it encourages people to innovate just in a different direction. So if you introduce laws, for instance, which put a, pri a primacy on privacy, then there are going to be entre entrepreneurs and innovators who start developing interesting new ways of uh, finding uh, privacy in whatever context or in whatever application it comes. Stepping back uh, and just trying to draw together a number of the threads that have been uh, thrown out there in this conversation, I think when it comes to digital technology, and here I'm very sensitive to, to, to Neil's perspective as a historian, I think we expected the world to become like the technologies that we invented. So we saw the internet was a kind of decentralized model, and we thought that the world would become more decentralized. But the opposite has happened. The internet was born into a world in which states are very powerful, uh, and in which companies are very powerful. And lo and behold, the internet has become something in which states are made more powerful and companies are made more powerful. The exact same thing has happened with blockchain. If you look at five years ago, just five years ago, earnest people in Harvard were telling me blockchain is going to get rid of banks. Blockchain is going to, is going to disintermediate states. It allows people to trust each other without any need for overbearing centralized institutions. Lo and behold, Blockchain is born into a world of powerful corporations and powerful states. And where are the best blockchains? They're owned by states and they're owned by Barclays Bank because, that, because technologies are shaped by the world they are born into, just as they in turn shape uh, that world. And that's something that we, I think we, 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 I certainly always try to remind myself when I think about these issues. Uh, Neil, I think you should uh, take Jamie on the road with you so because that was a nice and acute uh, summary of the last chapter of the tower and the square where you end up taking sort of the network thinking proponents like uh, Anne-Marie Slaughter on and you say no in fact we've now reasoned through a number of pages how in fact uh, the nation state and control apparatus can come back should come back will come back and Jamie's just done that summary for you um, but I wonder if you if you could 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 weigh into that I mean we've seen Obviously, I mean, we're worried about the mitigators of the technology on the American uh, side and how Europe addresses these value differences, because that's what we can see. That's what we see is at play.
uh, everything else is perhaps not as obvious and we can't lean into that in that same way. Um, you know, maybe that's where the, the breaking point on the, on the Cold War piece is because there are these, uh, these dependencies that economically did not exist with the Soviet Union. There was all the, there was, uh, you know, of course, all the, uh, uh, the, the, system, the systemic rivalry piece, but we weren't as interwoven with the economic capacities, uh, of course, of the Soviet Union at the time. So I wonder if you could just comment on on uh, on those last that those last parts uh, of Jamie's um, uh, yeah. answer there. I, I'll start I'll start actually with with Jamie and then and go back to Marietta because I think uh, Marietta I think the um, the interesting thing for me is the extent to which uh, you you see the the structural change from the decentralized World Wide Web. Uh, to the highly centralized world of, of network platforms in a very short space of time. And, uh, you know, it's quite right, as Jamie says, that the, the kind of libertarian uh, vision of uh, the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace kind of disintegrated with amazing speed, though it didn't really strike us, I think, until 2016, how how bad the situation had, had become. And even then, I've been struck by how paralyzed uh, in the US, we've been in response to this a dystopia. And it, and it is dystopian when you reflect on it, that a handful of companies had the power to cancel the elected president of the United States and, and essentially remove him from a large part of the public square uh, back in, in January. It, it dismayed me that so many Democrats were just happy to applaud this, uh, uh, seemingly unaware that what goes around comes around in history. And uh, the minute you celebrate the, the power of Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg to censor the elected uh, president of the republic, uh, you're on a fast track to, to a very science fiction uh, world in which there are two panopticons, one controlled by the Chinese Communist Party and the other controlled by Silicon Valley. And I'm not sure which is less accountable at this point. It might well be that, uh, that it's actually the Western version when we look back as historians on this evolution, we need to understand two things. First, that a network structure is a, a complex system that is capable of phase transitions. We went from a decentralized to centralized architecture in just a few years. And most of us didn't pay much attention to that because we were too delighted by uh, what the network platforms were offering us, Amazon, free stuff, uh, or cheap stuff, Facebook, free stuff. When one looks back at the sequence of events, I do think the critical turning point was the ads-based financing model, that once uh, the, 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 the way of making money at Google had been established and then replicated at other platforms, notably Facebook, uh, an entirely uh, pathological system had been established whereby the platforms were incentivized to make their money uh, by retaining eyeballs on screens for long enough for ads to be seen. And that, that was the moment that the fake news, extreme views uh, uh, problem became really chronic because the, the algorithms in all the major platforms were, were bound to promote uh, those things. That, that was at the core of it. And Mark Andreessen made the point the other day that it didn't need to be that way, that that was a slightly unexpected development. If you think about the evolution of the printing press, the sell selling of, of ads was a really small part of the history of the printing press. It came really in the late 19th and 20th century with the realization that you could actually make quite a bit of money with ads in magazines and newspapers. But most printed matter since the late 15th century wasn't selling stuff. And, and you go into uh, the uh, university library, go to Widener, uh, the data arranged, the knowledge is arranged, the printed matter is arranged in a completely different way from the way it would be if, uh, if there had been an ads uh, model for making money, for monetizing printed content from, from the outset. So I think a critical question is, can we ever wean ourselves off that model? And secondly, can we ever reclaim the data that we gave them in return for cheap stuff? I mean, the, 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 clearly the, the value of the data was much greater than the value of the services we got in return for it. But we actually have the big problem that suckers throughout history have. It's very, very difficult to go back and do the trade again and price our data 
uh, properly? And I don't think anybody has a good answer to that question. It seems like the original sin lay there with the, uh, the giving away of the data. Uh, so those are those are the kind of two issues that seem to me to be crucial. No, no amount of regulation, I think, can fix those problems. They are now fundamental to the nature of the internet. Uh, and I'm not clear in my own mind what one could do to undo them. Uh, in that sense, there's path dependence. We have the internet that we we were willing uh, to let Jeff Bezos and, and uh, Eric Schmidt and Mark Zuckerberg build, and it serves us right. Uh, secondly, in, in terms of the strategic implications of, of this, uh, there is now a permanent state of cyber warfare which resembles Hobbes's state of nature. And that, that is being waged not only by the superpowers, uh, but by the minor powers and by non-state actors and hybrid entities that claim to be non-state actors when the Russians are actually running them. And this is very puzzling for people who've grown up studying previous conflicts because there appears to be no deterrence in this domain at all. And nor indeed does there appear to be peace. And therefore the problem in, uh, in cyber warfare is that it's never ending. And unlike nuclear war, which is either happening or not, it's binary, you have multiple potential scales of cyber warfare up to and including the total paralysis of the critical infrastructure of a major state, which we haven't yet seen, but we'll see. That will come. And that is the next disaster that I think is much more imminent than most people realize. The moment when the experiments having been run, you actually can take a, a major power offline and just see what happens. So I think that's a major concern because the people who think about strategy uh, at places like Harvard and Stanford struggle to escape from the paradigms of deterrence that they learned in Cold War I. There is no deterrence in Cold War II, and there are multiple actors uh, and multiple scales of, of, of conflict. There isn't a book yet like Kissinger's nuclear weapons and foreign policy back in the 1950s, which said, here's how we should think about this problem that nuclear weapons have created. Nobody has yet written uh, cyber warfare and foreign policy because we, we desperately need that. As long as we haven't really rethought from first principles, we won't understand the nature of Cold War II. And I come back to my 17th century analogy. The 30 years war didn't end because of deterrence. Uh, and it didn't end because one side had a military breakthrough that was decisive, it, it, a technological military breakthrough that was decisive. It had ended because there was a, an agreement, which we call the Peace of Westphalia, to stop doing certain things because they were just too destructive. I, ultimately, our 30 years war ends when we re reach a point of such exhaustion with cyber attacks that we have to agree to stop doing them uh, and to, to aggressively pursue uh, those who violate the international agreements. So I'm looking to a cyber Westphalia. That was where the square and the tar ended as a book. And my question is, do we really need 30 years of, of utter mayhem to get there? Well, the diagnostic would lead us to believe that, in fact, we are gearing up for this era of, of all-out war, um, because if you look at the National Security uh, Commission's AI report, it's how you tie everything together, how you gird yourself for ongoing competition in this sphere at every level of society. Um, that doesn't conclude necessarily with how we uh, get to a, a resolution. So we'll go maybe to some of the strategic and international questions in a second. I do want to note uh, that we are about ready to go into the audience Q&A portion. Um, but as we do, I want to bring up a question that has come up uh, in the Q&A, Maritia, that gets to Neil's second to last point, which is about individual responsibility. Um, and we have a question here from Mirko Kripa who says, Aren't we moving more and more into a society or a political setting where individual responsibility is rising, not only for oneself, but the collective? And that's seemingly a, a, a big ask to make of the individual. So he continues, in a highly complex world, is it this individual responsibility and the decision to bear it yourself or to delegate it someplace, democratic leadership, authoritarian leadership, that will determine how we move through this phase, either led by democracies or led by the world's autocracies? I thought you could 
have the most interesting perspective to begin that question? Well, let's hope, but thanks for the question. Um, or perhaps alternatively, you know, to, to delegate the responsibility to decide to the big tech companies. Uh, and, and that is, of course, for those companies that have such an immediate relationship with the individual. And I agree with, with the person who asked the question that in, in many solutions proposed to this, you know, uh, ungovernable sphere and excessive hoovering up uh, of data that can be used, you know, to our detriment in, in a number of ways, there is too much hope placed on the individual. Uh, we hear about, you know, cyber hygiene or better skills. And to be honest, there, there is no set of skills or precautions that an individual behind their devices at home can take to weigh up, stand up against the armies of lawyers and engineers and designers that are producing their cookies and their terms of use and their buttons to click in uh, so many more clever ways than anyone with even the best skills can can understand that I think it's a path, obviously, you know, empowering the individual is crucial in a democracy and the more digital skills they have, the better. But to see that as a uh, decisive solution, I, I disagree. And, you know, we, we might compare it to um, the role of, of the pharmaceutical industry and, and doctors uh, and the questions of how much wisdom a patient uh, can reasonably have to know exactly you know, which medications are healthy for them and how to take them. So obviously there is responsibility for the individual in that case, but there is a whole host of labeling, testing, um, requirements, um, um, prescriptions, uh, expertise that goes into that relationship. We do not say, well, let's just educate the patient in a way uh, that they can themselves understand best what to take and how to take it from, you know, the pharmacy against which which illness. So in many ways, I think we need to normalize the notion of, of regulating for consumer safety, public health, uh, national security, and so on. But I wanted to encourage everybody to, to really look beyond the companies whose names we know, beyond the companies that have relationships with consumers where there's even an, an option to be better informed in the decision making. There are ecosystems of companies that operate in no relation to an individual. They are business to business or uh, business to, to state. Uh, they provide technologies that you know we um, generally have not heard of and do not directly interact with. But the fact that they are, again, run by private companies creates new types of risks. For example, uh, in the space that Neil just talked about, you know, this, this perpetual and invisible conflict. And uh, I would say that there are two areas where uh, there is a huge task upon democracies. One is how much um, response offensive capability, in other words, so uh, striking, striking before you can be struck, um, is legitimate and legally possible now within democratic societies. I think the temptation and the practice is to strike back covertly, uh, and uh, that actually perpetuates this invisible, unaccountable kind of conflict that happens uh, indeed between states, but also non-state actors, and I, I think that's, that's a trap. Uh, Instead, it would help to systematically build up uh, ways to create more understanding about the methods and the actors, so to, to make available analysis of cyber attacks more public um, or publicly, to um, work together also between like-minded nations to attribute attacks, so to say, with the information that we have and that we've shared, uh, combining operational intelligence, political information, we can see that this or that actor, and Neil also um, hinted to that, that sometimes a company may be an instrument of a state, that sometimes a militia or criminal group can be you know, on the strings of a state. This kind of pointing to who is responsible and attaching consequences. So in other words, creating more accountability in line with principles of international law is urgent. If we do not want not only this invisible and perpetual conflict to persist, uh, to persist invisibly, but really to bring it back in the realm of, of notions of, uh, of accountability and uh, a form of, of justice, I think that that would really help 
help at least a little bit uh, to bring an end to this sort of impunity that we see for those who wage um, cyber attacks for criminal or geopolitical goals. But there is a big task upon democratic states to do so in line with democratic principles. Well, because international law has been brought up, and in this context, Jamie, you're, I think, our only lawyer, um, <laughs> uh, you know, in terms of both how Neil and Maritia have approached the questions of, of national and international security and sort of sense-making um, in the field of law. I wonder if you want to lean into that, but I want to bring in a question from the audience as well, uh, which I think uh, you're probably the best person to answer at this moment from Johannes Alfeld uh, from the SPD, who is thinking about the li about liability issues that you raised earlier. So he says, in the US system with property, of course, comes liability. And when there is ISP abuse, when ISPs abuse your data or do not you know, put forth the kind of security standards that, uh, you know, white, might equate to safe storage. Um, how, you know, how does the law, how should the law be acting and reacting there? Are we looking at a whole new category of class action suits? And if so, is that going to set the parameters for good behavior of big tech? Right. Well, I'm not going to try and add to what Maritia and Neil have said on the international point because um, I can't. So I will turn separately to the question from the audience. Data protection is a dull but really important topic. And there's a problem with it. There's a problem with the way that we think about it. And the problem is with the words data protection and the problem is with the words privacy. We've inherited this idea that the problem with data with personal data is that someone else is going to get our data, whether through a leak or stealing it, and through that data, they're going to be able to know private things about us uh, that are embarrassing or shameful or that we wouldn't want them to know. That was the way that data was traditionally thought about in the second half of the last century. And it is a big deal. It is important, but it has stopped being the most important thing about the way that we govern data. Data matters because when it is gathered together in large amounts, it enables new and strange forms of power. Machine learning systems are able to process data when it's gathered together uh, and find patterns and learn skills that uh, computers of the past couldn't do and often humans can't do. And those patterns and skills are important because they are often used to influence or manipulate us or just to do things in the world. Uh, so for instance, algorithms that decide whether you get a job or whether you get credit or whether you get insurance uh, or whether your face is going to be recognized or whether your voice is going to be heard by a particular system. How these systems are designed and engineered matters. And when we talk about governing data, we're talking about governing the systems that use that data. So we need to move beyond our focus just on privacy and data protection. The truth is that in America, there are very, very few rules about what a personal company may do with data which has been lawfully acquired. So if you happen to come into some data, you can do pretty much whatever you want with it, uh, subject to a few sectoral regimes here and there and a few particular and a few bespoke systems in the states. I, I would propose a completely different approach. I think we should be clear in our minds about the purposes to which is it, it is acceptable to put data, the inferences which is it, it is acceptable to use data to draw about us the surveillance, which is, is acceptable or not acceptable to conduct using data. Surveillance doesn't mean a spy standing behind a window peering at you through the street anymore. We can be seen in our most intimate and private spaces. We can be seen, the inside of our mind and our soul can be seen and increasingly in a way that the princes and, and priests of the past could never have dreamed of. We are seen in ways through our data not which identify us necessarily as individuals, as Jamie Suskind or as Neil Ferguson, but in ways that can identify us as types. This person has these qualities and is thus likely to like this or want to do that. The truth about data in the 21st century is that it has long ceased to be about the protection against data leaks. That's really important, but it is a tiny part of the project. And what we need is an intellectual overhaul, which again, I have to give credit to the European Union has begun in Europe, whereby we take a much more um, 
let's call it purposive approach to the governance of data and we decide what should and shouldn't be it should and shouldn't be used for and just um just to, to bring this to life with one example i'm a discrimination lawyer by background uh, and so I'm often asked whether discrimination law is adequate to deal with the way that algorithms, for instance, use data. And sometimes that it is. So, for instance, if an algorithm tells you that you should be recruiting people from a particular part of town, but not another part of town for whatever reason, because the data tells it that, um, it might be indirectly discriminatory because the people in the uh, other part of town might disproportionately come from a particular ethnic group. And so discrimination law would have something to say about that. But then there's other stuff like this. If you type your name, if you apply for a loan online and you type your name in using all lowercase letters rather than capitalizing the first letter of your first name and the first letter of your second name, then machine learning systems have detected that you are substantially less likely to pay back your loans. Should that be a factor that is taken into account when granting you a loan? Likewise, machine learning systems suggest that if you are Facebook friends with people who default on their loans, you are less likely to pay back your loans. If you're Facebook friends with someone who is a criminal, you are less likely to pay back your loan. Should the system be able to take that into account? I'm not saying these are easy questions. I am saying they're moral and political questions, and I'm certainly saying the discrimination law doesn't have an answer to them, because discrimination law is about dealing with protected characteristics like age and sex and race, which have historically been the basis of injustice. But machine learning systems and the way that data is used now can generate all kinds of new injustices that we've never thought of before. So, um, to, to answer your question, property law and, and even data protection law, as we've inherited it from the middle of the last century, is not going to cut it. We need to, uh, as a society, decide the, the, the proper basis, the proper philosophical basis on which data about us may be used. And as Maricha said, these are collective problems, right? So uh, you shouldn't be governing problems like this by asking individuals a thousand times a day whether they consent to their data being used. That offers no protection. That places you completely at the mercy of a system in which you have no agency at all. These are rules which can only be decided and enforced collectively. We have just a few more minutes left, but I, I like the arc that we've begun with the digital revolution moved on to the pitfalls and challenges of the data revolution in which we currently find ourselves and are now squarely in a debate on what uh, AI will do to not only our societies, the interfunctionality of societies and global competition, but then also how it challenges our framework. Of, of laws and brings in our own individual responsibility in trying to address something that is so quickly advancing, we might never be able to uh, wrap our minds around it. So because Maricia and Neil brought up uh, the international components of that, and because Jamie noted uh, how much in legal culture, and of course there are differences, that are historically grown, back to the analogy of uh, history, in our legal cultures in terms of how we might think through these issues, uh, not only on the ownership piece, but then really also on, 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 on big questions of, of framing. I thought maybe we would lean one last round, and we have a few more questions coming in, um, into the international piece, um, because we have seen as I mentioned earlier, not only um, you know authoritarian regimes setting themselves into or, or putting themselves into these sort of standard uh, giving positions, but of course we've witnessed that you know become part of geopolitical doctrine. So um, you know, in as much as you have a, a race uh, between Facebook uh, and the People's Republic of China <clears throat> to Hoover up. Uh, the data of, of countries that are only now coming online, that are leapfrogging through the different sets of these revolutions. The question becomes, I think, Neil, Mauritia, whoever wants to come in on this, um, <clears throat> what are other nations, where's the locus of addressing th those issues? Um, you know, the, the, the fact that non-state actors and nation states are now in some cases in open competition for the kind of data that will propel their capacities to control, forecast, uh, you know, individual and collective human behavior in this ongoing uh, 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 cyber race. Where are the regulatory, the legal, the behavioral um, tools to to come to come at those issues? <clears throat> 
Oh, Neil, we can't hear you. <laughs> Rookie error. Perhaps I could go first. Small amounts of data aren't much use. It's all about scale. The, the pattern recognition, uh, machine learning uh, forces described so well by Jamie there uh, can't be done with, uh, with small amounts of, of data. And that's why uh, it seemed like at one point uh, China would be the AI superpower because it had just large quantities of data and, uh, and very limited uh, restrictions on what could be done with it. I, I think that if you take uh, a look at what's going on, the same processes are at work in the two internets, the Chinese internet and the, the rest of the world, a sort of American-made internet, because I think they've always been two. There's been two internets, really, from the minute that the Chinese built their great firewall. Talk about the splinter net is mistaken because you can't you can't balkanize it, but you can have two internets. That's the that's why the Cold War analogy works quite well. And in both internets, uh, the government would like to have more access to the data gathered by the companies than they want to give. This is not a straightforward thing in China. There was actually a battle, uh, a really quite interesting battle last year between Alibaba and the Chinese Communist Party which the Chinese Communist Party won. And uh, I think that battle was partly over Jack Ma's attempt to resist the pressure that was being applied to, particularly the Ant, uh, uh, the Ant Group or Ant Financial by, by Chinese regulators, but it was part of a wider struggle for access uh, to the data. When I was working on this not so long ago, I was struck by the fact that from the vantage point of, of the Chinese tech community, it wasn't self-evident that the CCP would have unlimited access to Ali's and, and Tencent's databases. Uh, but I think that that it was always going to be decided that way in the sense that the CCP is ultimately able to insist on that access. Uh, the question is whether the same will be true of the mass, massive amounts of data that have been gathered by the Western tech companies. So, on all of us and part of what Snowden did was to slow that process down to slow the process down whereby the American state got access to the data but I don't think he halted it I don't think for a second that he halted it and I think the ultimate destination uh, will be that the the government's government of the United States will have access to whatever data it wants and it will arrive there through a variety of different regulatory routes. Uh, Anti-money laundering is a good example of this. One reason that blockchain will not set us free is that you can basically use the powers of the financial regulators in the United States to, to get access to, to crypto transactions if you want it. So I'm struck by the fact that in reality, our two worlds, our two internets are not so very different. And that's actually rather troubling. Uh, from the vantage point of this discussion, uh, it may not matter terribly much which of the panopticons you live in. You have no privacy. Now, from historians, from a historian's vantage point, the notion of privacy is some sacrosanct thing, thing that you keep, which allows you to keep large parts of your life to yourself. It's quite a recent notion. I mean, it's not the way that people think about data in the 16th and 17th century. We had to work pretty hard to build open societies, liberal societies in which the individual had significant autonomy. And we've given it up. We've given it up with amazing speed. Going back to the last question, it's a little bit uh, up to the individual how much he or she can claw back. But you need to be really much more paranoid than you are. But, I mean, we talk about privacy as if we still have it. We don't have it at all. It's absolutely not the case that we have privacy anymore. The issue is just who has access to the data. And you should fear the worst. You should definitely be pessimistic about where that data will ultimately end up. Uh, because the simplest route to power is clearly, as Stalin understood long ago, ac access to private data. And we've given so much of that up that we must assume a, a state of great paranoia, not just about our vulnerability to financial uh, 
fraud, which is very great, but more broadly to our vulnerability to, to the uh, sharing and publication of things that we thought naively were, were private. That, that, that age of privacy is over to a greater extent than most people want to face. Well, we violated a keen principle that we've uh, usually uphold here at Harvard is to give people hope and perspective, particularly with those last pronouncements by Neil. The author of a book called <laughs> Doom is not going to do that. <laughs> there is a question in the chat, which I think this panel has resoundly answered, which is, do we need more public intellectuals to think the complexity of these questions out with us so that we might seize more of this personal responsibility and this awareness? Um, so maybe that's the hope piece uh, in the fear for our own privacy, at least the awareness uh, of where action can and should be taken. So I think the resounding answer, given these three pronouncements we've heard uh, this evening, European time, midday, uh, American time is yes. Uh, I want to thank all three of you for this vivid and spirited and in-depth debate. We've covered more than I have seen in many conversations of the like over the short time. And it's my great pleasure to hand over to Gabriela Voideco, who will continue uh, this evening's program. Thank you to all of you. Thank you very much, Catherine Cleaver Ashbrook, Niall Ferguson, Jamie Suskind, and Marie Tiersake for really an inspiring discussion. Um, and thank you all to our participants for taking part uh, in the discussion, in the chat, and sharing your questions with us. Um, this was really a fast forward into the history of the digital communication revolution. And uh, it was really a very inspiring and, um, and highly interesting debate. Thank you once again.